One day, a guy from Tamil Nadu, South India, grabbed a jerry can. Leaving behind his mother, wife, and infant daughter, he headed to the railway station just to empty this can and set himself on fire, shouting death to Hindi, may Tamil flourish. This bizarre and very chilling event was my door to know more about the cultural struggle of the people, how their language and heritage are inseparable from the core of who they are, to an extent that they took every measure, and I mean it, every measure, to preserve it. I'm talking about the Tamil people, when a life without your language is not worth living. India has a lot of languages. I don't mean like a handful, I mean a lot of languages. They currently have 22 official languages and thousands of unofficial ones, spoken by millions of people for each language. And each language represents an ethnic group with the land, history, heritage and cuisine. One of those groups are the Tamil people, or the Tamils. So real quick, Tamils are a Dravidian ethnolinguistic people with a total population of around 80 million people. While the majority of Tamils live in India, they are also a noticeable minority in Sri Lanka, Malaysia, and Singapore. They have a very intense story in each country, ironically, but our main story in this video will take place in Tamil Nadu, the Tamil state of southern India. Before the independence of India in 1947, Tamil Nadu was under the name Madras State, which was a part of the Madras Presidency in the South, which was a part of the very nice and kind people we all know, British Raj. Those people spoke Tamil, their so beloved language, and it was the language taught in schools and everything, but in 1937, something happened. The first Indian National Congress came into power, and it was led by a man called Sira Jagopalchari. Don't panic, we can call him Rajaji. He came into power, but he had a philosophy of unifying India through language. But that language wasn't Tamil. It was Hindi, the Indo-Aryan language that was widely spoken throughout India and specifically the North. And the one you'll hear in Bollywood movies nowadays, by the way. It was made compulsory in the 125 Madras schools to teach Hindi in 1938. <coughs> Not cool, said the opposition party. Let's talk about that for a while. It was named the Justice Party, led by E. V. Ramasmi. Don't panic again, we can call him Periyar. Who also had a very influential movement called the Self-Respect Movement. It, it preached a lot of good stuff, like equal rights for all castes, fighting against oppressive traditions, so he had a respectable follower base. So we have the National Congress versus the Justice Party, or to frankly put it, Rajaji versus Periyar. The new laws were widely seen as a way to impose Hindi upon the Tamil people by the north. They felt that they wanted to wipe out who they are as people, and saw it as a serious threat to the Tamil identity and they acted quick. Periyar and Spari started to campaign against the laws immediately, and they weren't alone. The cause gathered the support of many Tamil intellectuals and religious figures, especially the Tamil Saivites, who are Lord Shiva's devotees. They were among the earliest supporters of the move, and guys, this is a big deal. I don't know if you heard, but religion is kind of a big thing in India. Not only intellectuals and religious figures, but Tamil women played an undeniably pivotal part in the Tamil movement. In November 1938, the Tamil Nadu Women's Conference took place to show women's support for the movement. So now we have mostly all factions of the Tamil people ready to go. And so they did. A wide range of demonstrations were organized to oppose the Hindi teaching laws. They were persistent. They fasted, they marched, and they did everything they can do to stop the imposition from moving forward. But that was met with relentless and cruel suppression and the death of the first two language martyrs, at least in this time frame, Natarajan and Talamudu. This was followed by escalated police brutality and the imprisonment of almost 1,200 Tamils, and that included children and women. No one was spared, even Periyar. He was in prison for a year and get why for inciting women to disobey the law. Yeah, he incited every living Tamil to disobey the law, but apparently you can't incite women. It's, it's wrong, fellas, don't do that. Anyway, he was released six months later, for medical reasons. Two months after his release, all the other protesters were released as well. Moving forward, the Congress party itself was not unanimous on this matter, as Rajaji's stance remained unchanged, 
other leaders in this party, like Satyamurti and Sarvapali Radhakrishnan, who will later be the second president of India, they opposed the imposition of Hindi upon the Tamil people and wanted to make it optional. But Radhaji refused and remained campaigning for Hindi until the party eventually resigned in 1939 to protest India's involvement in the world war, which gave Periyar and his party the chance to request for a stop to the compulsory teaching of Hindi. And so they did. In 1940, Lord Erskine, who was the British governor of Madras, stopped it and concluded the first wave of the language rights. It was done, at least for now. It's 1946. India is about to gain independence and a lot of discussions are starting. Before we talk about the second wave of riots, let's have a quick look at the politics of the newly found state of India. Remember when I said India has a mind-blowing amount of languages? Let's go back to that for a minute. In which one should they write the constitution and which one should they adopt as their official language? That was the kind of questions that was so hard and too scary to answer for everyone. India's position is unique. There's almost no reference of such diversity and abundance of cultures and languages anywhere else in the world. Things can get out of hands so bad, so fast, which it did. Okay, now to the politics and to 1946. The pro-Hindi people in the constitution drafting committee made it crystal clear that they want Hindi to be the sole language of the country with a very shocking statement made by R. V. De Laker, a prominent figure in the fight for independence and a member of the parliament. He said, People who do not know Hindi have no rights to stay in India. People who are present in the house to fashion a constitution for India and do not know Hindi are not worthy to be members of the assembly and they better leave. The anti-Hindi figures in the same assembly, on the other hand, made their case also clear that they need to retain English as the official language and the lingua franca between all future states. Which brings us to a remarkably important statement made by a notable figure called T.T. Krishnamachari, who will be the finance minister later on. He said, I disliked the English language in the past. I disliked it because I was forced to learn Shakespeare and Milton, for which I had no taste at all. If we are going to be compelled to learn Hindi, I would perhaps not be able to learn it because of my age, and perhaps I would not be willing to do because of the amount of constraint he put on me. This kind of intolerance makes us fear that the strong center which we need a strong center which is necessary will also mean the enslavement of people who do not speak the language at the center. I would, sir, convey a warning on behalf of people of the South, for the reason that there are already elements in South India who want separation. My honorable friends in UP do not help us in any way by flogging their idea of Hindi imperialism to the maximum extent possible, so it is up to my friends in Uttar Pradesh to have a whole India, it's up to them to have a Hindi India. The choice is theirs. Wow! I want you to read that again and tell me this wasn't the most perfect passive-aggressive political statement you've ever read in your entire life. It was for me. Anyway, after intense back and forth between the two sides, the end result was adopting Hindi as the country's official language and a period of 15 years for English to be weaned off the public usage and to prepare Hindi for being the sole language of the union. Not the best outcome for Tamils, but yeah, we can do with that. Or not. We will find out. While all of that high-end political discussions were happening, it was really getting intense in Madras state. The Justice Party is now the Dravidur Kazakhan Party. Periyar was on fire, and the anti-Hindi movement was fighting relentlessly the persistent attempts to impose Hindi on the Tamil people. It was something like that every time. The central government would try to make Hindi compulsory, the Tamil would rise, the decision would be reversed, repeat. But in 1948, the government made a bold attempt of making Hindi compulsory. Not just that, they set a minimum grade requirement to qualify for the higher class. <coughs> set our old friend Periyar in the DK. So yeah, repeat the cycle, demonstrate, fast, strike, black flags. And guess who wanted to visit Madras at this very time? Another old friend. It's a reunion, I guess. He was the governor general of India at the time, Rajaji. Periyar in the DK went crazy because of this visit. They organized further strikes, further black flag demonstrations, further street protests, for which he got in prison along with another prominent leader, C.N. Anadurai, and then later discharged. The government retained its stance, and so did Periyar and the DK. They imprisoned them again. But the situation became so dire for all who are involved, the leaders, the people, the government. A compromise had to be reached, and the government dropped the legal cases against all the protesters and the leaders. Two years later, in 1950, the compulsory Hindi teaching was dropped and made optional once again. It was a dreadful, yet a very successful wave of rights. 
the 1950s. It was a remarkably surprising and challenging decade for the politics of Indian language in the Indian parliament or the Lok Sabha. Tension was stirred up when pro-Hindi politicians started to speak up to make Hindi the national language. Again. This started a lot of official steps in the pro-Hindi direction once again, but this time, they treaded lightly though. I mean no compulsory laws yet, but they were certainly making Hindi the major language for any government affair. They launched voluntary Hindi teaching classes nationwide to accelerate the shift, you know. That was up until 1955, when Nehru appointed PGK, the chair commission called the first official language commission, to report in the situation. And this commission concluded that it's time for English to take a hike and for Hindi to play a more pronounced role. As you can guess, it wasn't good news at all for the non-Hindi speaking clan, especially the Tamils. That would mean more Hindi in their states and more compulsory Hindi teaching. That is a direct threat to their heritage, to their culture and their language. Which as you would have guessed by now, kind of big deal. Of course the Tamils didn't accept and the state of Madras along with West Bengal submitted descending notes on the report. To review the report, another committee in the Lok Sabha took place in 1957. It was under the name the Parliamentary Committee on Official Languages with Govind Balapant as chairman. Govind, be honest with me. Which side are you on? I mean, you can tell me it's a... This is not gonna be good. After two years of discussions in 1959, as expected, he seconded the CARE report and said Hindi should be the only official first language and English should be a limited subsidiary. Both commissions were condemned by the non-Hindi speaking states. A very noticeable name on the opposing side would be Frank Anthony. Not because it's a Hollywood name, it's because the guy was a very influential individual and arguably the most influential at the time among Anglo-Indians. This condemnation from the anti-Hindi states was as always unexpected, so relentless, and during those two years of parliamentary deliberations, a lot of people came around. You won't even believe who came around. The old-time villain of the pre-independence Madras day, Raja Ji. He came around and joined the anti-Hindi clan so hard. He joined them so hard he organized a conference himself called the All India Language Conference, only to oppose the switch, declaring that, and I quote, Hindi is as much foreign to non-Hindi speaking people as English is to the protagonist of Hindi. And that's coming from Raja Ji. What a plot twist. I mean, come on, government. Even Raja Ji came around. We're waiting for you. Once again, after very exhausting discussions, Nehru decided to embrace the non-Hindi speaker's will and said, there must be no imposition. English would be an additional language for an indefinite amount of time. He wouldn't want non-Hindi speakers to feel that certain doors of advance are close to them because of their languages. Those words alleviated a lot of stress, but not all of it. The Tamil people were so doubtful as to whether those promises would be fulfilled or not. Back in Madras, everything was boiling and building up to a very tense situation in the background while the government was discussing the politics and the constitution and whatnot. The DMK party was battling Hindi imposition and students kept protesting. A very notable protest was the Kalkadi town protest in 1953. They suddenly changed the town's name to name it after a northern businessman from Bihar who had a cement factory at the town and requested that the town to be named after him. Seriously dude, what kind of oblivion are you living in? People are breaking their necks for over a decade to preserve what they have and you go like oh you should remove the Tamil names and name things after me. I mean the timing man. The, the timing. This of course caused more trouble than everyone anticipated. A Bihari businessman coming and changing Tamil names as they please, the DMK didn't stay idle and organized a serious protest that ended up with Tamils lying down on train tracks as a form of protest. This incident caused the death of two people who were reportedly not affiliated with the protest and 16 other people injured. What's remarkable is that the leader of this protest was M. Karananadi, who would later be the longest running chief minister of Tamil Nadu with a record of five terms. The new name was scrapped, the imprisoned were released. Moving on to what's even worse. So, it's 1963. The ultimatum on English usage is getting closer, and that means more Hindi. Again. And by a presidential order from Rajendra Prasad, the president at the time, compulsory Hindi teaching and translation of all legal codes came into place, along with the first Hindi glossary. The Tamils specifically, and Southerners generally, started acting immediately and questioning Nehru about his former promise to keep English as a first language along with Hindi. Do you get now why they were skeptical in the first place? To which he replied that this is a bill in continuation of what has happened in the past. But when the bill came out, its wording was distinctively problematic. As it states, the English language may 
continue to be used in addition to Hindi, which can be easily interpreted by future administration as may or may not. The DMK pointed out that it demands the change of the word may to shall to make it more clear and affirm good intentions towards non-Hindi speakers. In November 1963, the bill passed without any changes. Given everything I told you earlier in this video, can you guess what happened? Anadure, a prominent DMK leader, launched a wide protest in Madras against Hindi, which ended in his own imprisonment and another 500 of his followers. In Jan 1964, the first self-immolation that started a whole wave of violent demonstrations against Hindi started when Shinasami, a DMK member, put himself on fire while shouting death to Hindi, may Tamil flourish. He didn't just put himself on fire, he spread it to the heart of all Tamils to just begin the big agitation. Sadly, Nehru died in 1964, the same year as the self-immolation incident, and the whole case now was even more volatile and uncertain. Everyone had to wait for the next Prime Minister to predict in which direction would everyone go. It was Lal Badur Shastri, a very strong Hindi supporter. Madras state suggested a three-language formula that would allow Hindi, English and Tamil to work together. It wasn't met with any enthusiasm from the central government. For the whole year, the opposition has been widely growing. In 1965, the Tamil Nadu Students Anti-Hindi Agitation Council was formed, and it was a game changer. It was a student organization responsible for the revolution against Hindi in the biggest anti-Hindi agitation Tamil Nadu or Madras state at the time has ever witnessed. After a series of conferences and minor protests, the council declared that on Jan 26, the same day of the Republic Day of India, they will organize a mourning day. The central government told them that they will not tolerate any protests on this particular day of the year, as it has something to do with the whole country's pride, as it was a newly independent country after all. They obliged and organized a mourning day one day earlier, but the protests will go as planned. On the 25th of Jan, the police made a major roundup of DMK and anti-Hindi politicians to curb the protests by keeping the leaders in custody. It backfired. The movement now was angrier than ever. A peaceful protest turned into a full-blown riot, arson, looting, property damage, you name it, burning and tearing apart every Hindi sign in the streets and railway stations. The police opened fire and the whole situation went out of hand. The chief minister couldn't control the situation with the police alone. He had to call in paramilitary forces to stop the riots. It was that drastic. More Tamils took the self-immolation road, sadly, along with others who poisoned themselves as a statement. Two union ministers, C. Subramaniam and O. V. Edgerson, from Madras State, submitted their official resignations. Hell broke loose for two weeks. A lot of people were dead, at least 70 by official counts, and as high as 500 by unofficial ones. It went on. Despite DMK leaders calling off the protest, there was no turning it off now. The protesters did not back down. Up until Chastri made a radio statement saying that he was shocked from the riots and Hindi will not be imposed and English will remain. The agitation ended on the 16th of February and both ministers recanted their resignation. Right after the riots in 65, the central government agreed to implement the three languages formula that will help integrate local languages along with English and Hindi. The pro-Hindi states and representatives, they fought that so hard, with two states, Maharashtra and Gujarat, submitting official opposition to these measures. But it passed anyway. Along with the slowing down of Hindi influence across the nation, the agreement was not a major success, and reportedly it was confusing, impractical, and not widely enforced, which called for the subject to be reopened in 1967 after the death of Shastri and Indira Gandhi assumption of office. It put the anti-Hindi movement as we know it to an end by accepting a final amendment that clearly admits to the bilingualism of India and that English would be working alongside Hindi as the official language of India. You'd think everything is cool now, but far from it. Ah shit, here we go again. As of 1968, the failed three language formula was still in effect, along with the compulsory teaching of Hindi. A violent protest erupted to put an end to this, and it succeeded. Only Tamil and English can be taught in school now, and the three-language formula stopped. Even more anti-Hindi policies came into effect, like stopping any Hindi commands in the national cadets and making Tamil the official administrative language in colleges. Is it cool now? I think we can all rest and meet again in 1984. So, 
India's Prime Minister Rajiv Gandhi started up a cool initiative of recruiting talented students for the economically and historically disadvantaged in rural India. And that was in a new educational institution called Navodaya Schools. It was supposed to provide them with high quality education compared to the one in the expensive private schools. That sounds nice, right? Hindi teaching would be compulsory in Navodaya schools, so that doesn't sound nice to some people we all know by now. They demanded the scrapping even of bilingualism in the constitution, as they saw misused by the government and making English the sole language of the union. They said that the government once again is trying to impose Hindi under the protection of Part 17 in the Indian constitution that states Hindi as an official language alongside with English, so they wanted to make English the only one. The demand was seen by the center as taking things too far. But too far isn't there yet. In November 86, a violent riot erupted. 21 Tamils ended their lives, once again, by self-immolation. A massive police roundup arrested thousands of DMK members, including Karunanadi, who again was a previous chief minister of Tamil Nadu at the time and the longest serving chief minister later on. To put an end to this, and not replicate another 65, as if it wasn't replicated already, the Navodaya schools program never took place in Tamil Nadu to this day, making it the only Indian state without Navodaya schools. As recent as 2014, the Indian Home Ministry issued a statement asking government employees and officials of all ministries, departments, corporations, or banks to have made official accounts on social media to use Hindi, or both Hindi and English but give priority to Hindi. Mm. Mm. The highly revered Chief Minister Janalita replied to the government saying that this direction, and I quote, may cause disquiet to the people of Tamil Nadu who are very proud and passionate about their linguistic heritage. Yeah, no shit. Protests erupted briefly, but the government didn't persist, and the situation was quickly contained and usage of English was conserved. This relentless, bloody, and at times really tragic journey is a very unique chapter of history that will always fascinate me personally. No matter how you think of Tamil people and no matter how you feel about Hindi or Tamil, to go to such lengths to preserve who you are and never back down on making it clear, I am who I am and who I am will not be oppressed or erased. The mere attempt will not be entertained. This is just a very proud message that the Tamil people never stopped to express for decades. This movement also changed the politics of languages in India forever and gave the same privileges to all the southern states and the other non-Hindi speaking states. The movement started Tamil but ended up Indian. I don't agree with many of the methods used by the DMK at the time and the lost lives break my heart and every time I think about it I deeply fear for the families. But the overall respect I have for this movement comes from the comparison with different cultures that got wiped off the face of the earth. They got replaced with other cultures and their language was always the beginning. The Indian subcontinent was always the most ethno-linguistically diverse place on earth and it gave us a lot of heroic tales of people who never submitted to the cleansing of their own heritage. The Tamil people chapter was not the only one. Let's not forget the heartbreaking destruction of the Bengali people's language and heritage that happened on the very same Indian subcontinent at the hands of the West Pakistan government just to impose Urdu on them and it ended up in a tragedy. Both experiences give you just a glance on how the tongue is a powerful tool, how you can be made into different people and how your culture might be affected just by the words you use. It's interesting. This subcontinent will never stop being a distinguished and a distinctive case throughout history. So yeah, expect more stories to come. And if you like the content, like and subscribe. And always remember, this is just a point of view.